Today I'll be talking about a system that I built with my colleagues at Tableau Research to explore how natural language interfaces can help facilitate visual analysis. So how do people find insights and answers to questions in their data? Visual analysis is often a cycle rather than a linear process. It follows twists and turns as our understanding of the data grows. The person often is observed to have a conversation with their visualization. There are ideas that we can draw from natural language processing that will augment this visual analysis process that people are going through. Natural language has a long history of supporting querying, searching, and conversing with the system. Our work builds on a long history of natural language interfaces, particularly catered towards data analysis. Systems like Articulate, Watson Analytics, Q&A, often return a minimally interactive visualization in response to a user's utterance. Many of these systems start with a blank slate with limited context and require extensive modeling before the systems are effective. More recently, Datatone, presented at WIS last year, also produces a visualization based on a user's query. However, the system improved the analysis flow by providing ambiguity widgets that the user can change if the system's guess is wrong. However, the query expressibility tends to be limited. Our work extends data tone in several ways. Firstly, instead of focusing on generating a new visualization, we emphasize the analytical flow of a user exploring an existing visualization. With this more focused context, we can develop techniques for enhancing the expressibility of these natural language queries. At this point, I'd like to show you a short demo of our system and highlight some of the key features. I will then continue with the rest of the talk. So here is a map of earthquake data for the United States, and let's start by exploring the visualization. So I'm interested in large earthquakes. The system um, can recognize that large is mapped to a data attribute in the visualization called magnitude and sets it to be five and more. As a user, I can always go and tweak that to a different value. Here I set it to four. Moving on, I could add large earthquakes near California, because I'm from California. And the system modifies that um, to zoom into California with a couple of more ambiguity widgets. Yeah, the screen is not resolved to a 4 by 3 resolution, so it looks a little wonky, but it looks better on a widescreen format. Um, so following on some subsequent queries, I could say, how about near Nebraska? So the system saw that previously I was interested in large earthquakes, so even though I didn't explicitly mention that in this query, it carries this context from the previous queries and adds it to this, um, a feature that we call pragmatics. Moving on to another visualization. This is a time series line chart showing temperatures in New Zealand. I can say temperatures in October. And obviously the line chart zooms into October, but I could also do things like near October. And even though I use near similar to the map, since I'm starting off with the viz, the parser knows that near here has a temporal connotation and adjusts it to be a month before and after October. And as a user, I can go to this ambiguity widget and modify that. Um, in addition to uh, querying for time-related uh, information in the visualization, we have additional semantic enrichment with more time hierarchies such as seasons and quarters and semesters. So I could say in fall. 
And even though fall is not explicitly encoded in the visualization, um, the system can recognize that and modify the visualization accordingly. And now I can ask min max average shows it to me in Celsius, which is the default temperature setting here, but I'm, I live in the US and I really don't understand Celsius, so I probably want to see this in Fahrenheit, and the system will convert it. And just one more example. Uh, this is a bar chart showing GDP per capita for various countries. I can say find GDP between, and the system knows that I'm using GDP as a numerical attribute, so the auto-completion shows me the bounds of the values encoded in the visualization, which is 1,100 to 47,000, and I can choose anything within that range, and I'll highlight it, and maybe I want to sort it, because it's a bar chart, it's easier to parse when things are sorted, can sort it and want to add a categorical color, so I say color by region. Uh, here the data attribute is subregion, but the system can do a fuzzy string distance match between region and subregion and colors it. Um, and I can also query for stuff that's not in the same level of detail as in the chart. Um, so here, even though they're in countries and I say find North America, which is at a continent level, um, it'll find the United States and Canada for North America. All right. So, um, in particular, our work has the following technical contributions. We implemented a custom parser that uses a probabilistic grammar approach with predefined rules that are further refined using data attributes from the visualization. We extend the ambiguity widgets introduced by the data tone paper to other forms of ambiguity such as quantitative and spatiotemporal reasoning. We introduced the notion of language pragmatics to enable more conversational interaction with the visa rather than a command-like experience. We have built-in domain awareness of time, geographic, and quantitative reasoning by linking to existing knowledge bases. And lastly, we believe that natural language input should work well with other modalities that people often use in analysis, such as mouse interaction. So here's an overview of the system. And I'll be discussing each of these modules in brief in the interest of time, but refer to the paper for more details. The first component is the parser that parses the input query in order to make sense of it. The interface to Evisa is specified by a grammar that is applied algorithmically to provide a structural description of the input query. While pre-specified rules are loaded ahead of time, these rules are further refined by the data attributes in the current visualization. For example, a rule large value in place is refined to expect earthquake magnitude and a place from the data set in the map. A main challenge with natural language systems is communicating to the user the types of input possible. Evisa has an auto-completion component for text input that uses template rules from the grammar to immediately indicate to the user the possible expressions and values. As a user analyzes real-life data, the enrichment of the data's meaning with additional semantics helps with the overall expressiveness of these queries. The semantics module augments data with additional semantics and units such as time, space, and entities from existing knowledge bases such as Wolfram Alpha and WordNet. So here, for example, large is one of the tokens in the input query, but the problem is that large is not encoded as part of the map. So how do we interpret large and come up with a mapping to an attribute and value in the viz? Here we find that there is a strong semantic association between large from the query and magnitude encoded in the map using the Wu-Palmer semantic similarity measure on word senses in WordNet. Further, we can associate a range of magnitude values to the term large based on the description of magnitude shown here in Wolfram Alpha.
Other semantic enrichment includes basic unit types such as time, hierarchies, temperature, currencies, and quantitative units. One of Evisa's goals is to support analytical flow by enabling the user to have a conversation with the visualization. Conversation frequently consists of a series of related utterances, often referring to past references and context. This is termed as pragmatics in the NLP world. So my initial query is find large earthquakes near California. Consider a subsequent query, how about near Texas? As part of this conversational flow, the semantics of a particular query can be influenced by each other via transitional probabilities. There are multiple probable paths as seen here in this finite state machine. Attributes from the previous state such as large and earthquakes are all augmented to the given query, giving a higher product of their corresponding transitional probabilities in the finite state machine, leading to showing large earthquakes for Texas in the visualization. Natural language queries can inherently be ambiguous due to syntactic and semantic variations between the user's mental model and the system's model. We expose the ambiguity and enable the user to correct default choices through simple GUI widgets in the interface. Consider this query. Ambiguity for large is expressed as a slider widget set to a minimum magnitude of five. Similarly, an ambiguity slider is expressed for a fuzzy distance near, which is initially set to 100 miles around the center of California, automatically computed based on the density of points per unit area on the map. We also support syntactic ambiguity resulting from spelling and plurality variations and typos. Here is a system maps happy to two attributes, happy life years and happy planet index, ranked by a fuzzy string distance measure. So once the query is processed, the analytics module determines the type of analytical function that needs to be invoked to show the results in the interactive visualization. We support various forms of analytical functions, including descriptive statistics, such as min-max average, highlighting, and color encoding. In addition to these basic functions, we devoted additional attention to special cases of spatial and temporal analytics. A more comprehensive set of functions is described in the paper. So that wraps up a brief description of the overall system. And, um, you know, at Tableau, we've noticed that people tend to have a conversation um, when they're doing data analysis with the Tableau product. So we conducted a preliminary user study comparing Evisa with Tableau desktop. We had two goals for the study. The first one was to collect qualitative feedback on Evisa's features. And secondly, determine when people would like to use natural language as opposed to direct manipulation, such as drag and drop in Tableau. We had 12 participants complete five tasks on both Evisa and Tableau desktop. Tasks involved searching, filtering, and manipulating a viz to reveal specified information. And information about these tasks was shown in a table as, sh as seen in this picture to avoid giving exact wording to the user to enter. Each participant used one of a map, scatter plot, line, or bar chart. So natural language versus drag and drop. How do they compare? People reported that the approaches were complementary. Natural language was easier to learn, it was good for focus queries, and when you wanted to get a quick answer or you didn't know how to do something, it was a handy tool to use. Drag and drop was more powerful and expressive and probably better for more complex tasks or power users. Autocompletion was heavily used by most users. So, we think this is sort of a good step um, in using natural language for visual analysis, but there are several ways we can improve the system. While pragmatics was a useful feature for participants to break a task into smaller tasks, sometimes they didn't want the context to be carried over by a previous query. We are currently looking at supporting repair utterances for a user to modify the pragmatics behavior. 
A common feedback from study participants was the ability to chain queries together to form really long compound queries. This would involve extending the parser to allow for chaining of multiple rules in the grammar. While the parser and grammar allow for flexibility, we would also like to enhance the expressiveness by supporting more colloquial utterances. While we show a visor working for a single viz, we are currently extending this to dashboards and creating new charts from a given chart. And lastly, when people were given a text box to enter a query, the expectation was that the system had access to domain-specific and external knowledge. Hooking up more external knowledge bases to the system could help with that experience. And that sums up my talk. Uh, paper and study data are available at this link, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. So we have time for a few questions. Please raise your hand if you have a question, and the student volunteer will come to you with a microphone. Hi. Nice presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I was curious about uh, what happens during ambiguity selection. Specifically, if you uh, use a descriptor such as large, how do you pick that default? Um, and large may be contained outside the set of data. So if your data is like, for example, like mountain sizes, your data may be in reference to all mountain sizes, not to the data presented. So do you account for this? So by default, um, data attributes in the visualization are termed as the first class citizen. So I mean, since we're using a probabilistic approach, um, the probability of mapping, say, large to something in the data, if present, is marked higher than, say, external knowledge. Um, and we also have other types of criteria. So we know that certain terms have a numerical connotation, some have a spatial connotation. So we sort of look at the other metadata associated with these tokens and try to come up with a match within the visualization. Um, we don't try to map it to something completely external unless it can somehow be related to what's in play in the visualization itself. Because that's, that's a hard problem, and we sort of circumvented that hard problem by starting off with the viz as a context. Hi, I was wondering how would it compare to, a, say, a more structured query language where uh, with auto suggestion, you could get the user to sort of, or sort of, um, guide the user along specifying a mm -hmm. query. So the auto completion gives that, at least in Evisa, gives that false perception that the system is expecting something more structured, but in reality, it actually supports things that are more colloquial. So there's that disconnect um, between expectation of something that's more structured versus something that's more unstructured. Um, what we notice in just preliminary studies um, around with users, people tend to get frustrated pretty easily when they're expected to type in highly structured queries. I mean, that's kind of how historically natural language interfaces to databases sort of went obsolete because people just got really frustrated. And I think with search engines like Google, we're all rather spoiled, right? I mean, we, we're given a search box. We're just expected to type terse commands or things that may not be grammatically complete sentences and expect the system to parse it. So we, we are sort of working towards a less restrictive way of parsing that, um, but auto-completion tends to give that false persona that we are expecting structured input. So let's thank our speaker again. So remember that the speakers will be there at the end of the session. So if you have a, a 